Welcome. Hello, my name is Alan Shim, and I am the Director of Ultrasound Education at DGOSOM. If you are new to ultrasound, it can seem very daunting to learn a new skill. But not to worry, this quick video, first in a three-part series, will get you up to speed and scanning in no time. First, let's turn on the machine. These are two common machines, the Sonosite Export right here and the PX here. And you just want to make sure that it's plugged in to the wall and to the back of the machine. And that's the on button for the export. The PX, the on button, is in the back right here. And all you have to do is just flip the lid on and you're ready to go. Okay, now it's time to select the transducer, also known as probe, as well as the exam preset or type. And these exam presets are optimized for the tissue or organ that you're trying to scan. So usually the select pro button is near the top of the screen, about right here. And from there you have three columns for probes, here and here and here, as well as a drop down menu of the preset types. Now the question is, what is the correct probe to select? Well, let's talk conceptually about how ultrasound waves work. Imagine this swimmer is the wave. He has to swim through a medium. In this case, it is water. His forward motion is the propagation of the wave, and his stroke and kick leaves reflections of the water right here and here, and it is these reflected waves or echoes that actually come back to the probe and are generated into an image on the screen. Also, the faster that he kicks or pulls, the more echoes are generated, so that this is like the frequency or wavelength of the sound wave. Now these are side-by-side -side cross sections of the liver and gallbladder in a real life pro section and on ultrasound. Now imagine those sound waves going through. If we're talking about a uniform medium, the swimmer's reflected waves don't change and an isoechoic appearance is seen. In a less dense medium, the swimmer does less work, like here, and so the reflected waves are not as intense and appear darker on the screen. This is described as hypoechoic. However, when going through a more dense medium like um, a wall, gallbladder wall, or some fibrous tissue here, the swimmer has to work harder, and so the echoes or reflected waves are also more intense, and this is seen as hyperechoic. Now in fluid, like bowel in the gallbladder or in a blood vessel, there's little work done, and so these appear pretty dark or anechoic. Now that we have echogenicity defined, let's talk about the relationship between frequency, resolution, and attenuation. Imagine that each dot here in this matrix is a discrete structure. When the wave has a higher frequency, like here, the wavelength is short, and the wave hits every dot along this length. And remember, every dot, it reflects back. Um, so this is translated as an image. So because it hits every dot, there's a greater spatial resolution. And in ultrasound machines, it's actually pretty fine. It's uh, actually about 100 microns or so. Now, when the sound wave hits a discrete structure, there's energy that is dissipated. So that over time, the, there's so much energy that is lost that there's very little that's reflected back. And this is called attenuation. And in general, high frequency waves do not penetrate very deeply. Now a medium frequency wave, which is around the spectrum of about a millimeter um, or less, you have, you hit some dots, but you miss some of these dots right here, but the wave travels a little bit farther. Now in a low frequency wave or beam, we will miss a lot of these dots, so the resolution suffers, but it will penetrate deeper, so we have less attenuation. So in general, the frequency is directly related to resolution, but also related to attenuation. So if you need to scan something that's deeper, you want a lower frequency um, wave or, or wavelength. So now let's apply this to probe selection. First, what is it that you want to image? If it is less than the pinky's length from the surface, like here, that's about five centimeters or so, then you can use the high frequency linear probe. Uh, note the frequency range is on every probe and this is from 16 to 15 megahertz, which is a pretty high frequency. By the way, this is actually Dr. Evil from Austin Powers. I've always wanted to incorporate Dr. Evil in one of my videos, so thanks for indulging me. 
Now, if you have a, a structure that's actually deeper than five centimeters from the skin surface, this is where you want to use a low frequency, uh, low attenuating probe. And you have two options. The first is actually if you're dealing with a lot of ribs and you want to shoot the sound waves in between these like little tight rib spaces, then you really want to use something called the phase array probe, which has a small footprint and that allows you to shoot sound waves between rib spaces. Now, anything else, you probably should use the curvilinear probe right here because it does offer a little bit better resolution than the phase array probe. Now that we have the probe and exam selected, let's talk about what is actually being imaged. Ultrasound generates two-dimensional cross-sections or scan planes. So for example, you don't see the entire cucumber, you actually see slices, these 2D slices, and it can be sliced lengthwise or in the long axis, or in the transverse or short axis, or if you slice it in this direction, you would have an oblique scan plane or cross-section. In POCUS, you are the wielder of the knife, and how you move the probe governs what scan plane you obtain. So for example, in echocardiography, you can obtain a long axis here in the blue, you can obtain a short axis, the yellow plane, or an oblique or coronal or apical axis in the green plane. And you can do this by oftentimes just a basic movement like rotation of the probe. Here, we're going from a long axis to a short axis just by rotating this probe right here. So now that we have scan plane defined, we also need to briefly discuss orientation. There's a dot on the probe as well as on the screen. And in general, the probe dot should point toward the patient's right or your left if you're facing the patient, while the dot on the screen should be at the top left. In this coronal cross section, the probe dot is pointed upward so that on the screen, everything on the left is towards the head and everything towards the right is towards the feet. The top of the screen is lateral because this is where the probe is situated and it points medial so everything deep to the screen is actually more medial. And in this image, the probe is on top of the abdomen and pointed posteriorly towards the back. So the top of the screen here is anterior while the deeper is actually posterior. And because the probe dot is pointed leftward as well as the screen dot here, this means that everything on the left of the screen is actually leftward or on the patient's right, and everything on the right side of the screen here is towards the patient's left. Now, another quick way to remember how to think about what is on the screen is just to remember that basically the sound waves are coming from wherever you place the probe. So if you place the probe against someone's side, this is, this is like a coronal image, which is a side-by-side. -side. If you put this on top of someone's abdomen, then this is an anterior-posterior image where this is anterior and this is posterior. And the dot itself is always corresponds to this blue dot on the screen. So uh, also notice that the footprint, the outline of the screen corresponds to the footprint of the probe. So here, this is the curvilinear probe, and you could also see um, here on the bottom left that says C60. C stands for curvilinear. Uh, this is the phase array probe, and you can see here it says P21, P for phase array. And then this is the footprint for the linear probe. Notice that it's very linear. And you could see uh, here it says HFL, which stands for High Frequency Linear Transducer. All right, let's time for some practice. What is this orientation right here? What is this and what is this? It's lateral and medial because the probe is pointed from a lateral to medial position. So this is on the top lateral and this is medial. What about this one? This one is here and here. This is actually superior and this is inferior um, because the indicator out is pointed towards the patient's head. So that means this is superior. Uh, you could call it cephalad, and this is inferior or caudal. What about this orientation right here? If you guess anterior posterior, you are correct. And the reason is that this is pointed from an anterior to, the, to a posterior position. So this is anterior, this is posterior, 
the indicator dot is towards the patient's right, so this is towards the patient's right, and this is the patient's left. All right, let's now talk about probe and hand movements. Really, really important. Remember that you are the wielder of the knife or scalpel, and that subtle movements of the probe will lead to very different slices or scan planes. So you have to put your fingers closer to the transducer head and really try to anchor your hand to the surface of the skin and really learn to isolate your movements to just one direction or plane. So for example, fanning is this movement along the broad face of the probe right here, and the scan plane moves sort of like a fan, uh, hence the term fanning. And note that the movement is just along this direction. There's no movement in this direction either. And note that the many different scan planes that you can obtain just by this slight movement back and forth. Next is angling. This movement is along the narrow face of the probe here, and you can see the image swing back and forth on the screen. And this is why this is also often to re referred to as rocking the probe, kind of like rocking the image back and forth. Now next is rotation. This is movement along the axis that's created by the handle or the cable of the probe. And note that you're just rotating the probe like this. And this is really similar to a ballerina performing a pirouette. And in this case of the heart, you can often get from a long axis uh, here to a short axis right here. The last probe movement is actual translation or sliding of the probe. And as this echo shows, you don't often need to slide too much to really get different windows. All right, this is the last section of the video. Let's talk about adjusting the depth and the gain. For depth, imagine that you are in a submarine. So if you want a more superficial depth, you go up here, you slide up, and if you need to go deeper, you actually dive down or press the down button. Now for gain, if you rotate to the right or slide to the right, it's brighter or more hyperchoic, and to the left is darker. So why is appropriate depth so important? Well, the machine sends pulses of sound waves like here, and they're interrupted by episodes of listening for the reflected echoes. The more pulses that are sent, the better the resolution. And so the less deep that you need to go, the better the resolution. So this is why you want the structure of the images to fit in as much of the screen as possible without being cut too down, and you need more depth here. And you also don't want to waste this real estate right here because that will reduce the resolution of the image. So you want less depth or going up. Now the gain increases the brightness of all returning echoes. So you want your gain so that you can see the different structures on the screen really well. Too little gain like here and everything appears dark or hypochoic. And then too much gain here and everything is bright or hyperchoic. This is just right because you can see the ring and the ball in the middle really well. So let's end with a little bit of practice. You have this image right here. What do you want to do? That's right, you need more depth, so you need to dive deeper or press down. What about here? Yep, you need less depth, so you actually surface or press the up button to decrease the depth. How about here? Well, this looks pretty dark or hypoechoic, so you really need to increase the gain, and that means sliding right. Now, this last one is a little tricky. So it's hyperechoic here, so you want to slide left to decrease the gain. Also, there's a lot of wasted space right here, so you want to decrease the depth by surfacing or pressing up. All right, great job, guys. Thank you for watching this video. Now it's time to scan. Or if you have a few more minutes, you can go on to the next video on ultrasound modes.